again. Okay. So tonight we're going to re uh, look at what we looked at last lesson and go a little deeper. But the goal is in the, the lessons coming ahead, we're going to be looking at a part of the fear of the Lord that should be very self-evident if we just stop and think about it. And one of the verses that we use when speaking about this is Job 9, starting in verse 34 and 35. Let him remove his rod from me, and let not dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak and not fear him, but I am not like that in myself. So Job is speaking about the reality that, that God is so much bigger, more powerful in every aspect compared to us, that if God did not limit how much of him we we saw and understood he could overpower us, very easily overpower us. So we think about in our house electricity, we have 110 and 220. Sometimes you'll see shops that have three phase, which is more powerful. We see these huge big transmission lines that go from city to city maybe with a million volts of electricity in them. And I don't know if you've ever noticed or not, but they don't put insulation on those wires. Mm -hmm. Have you ever noticed that? Look at it next time when you're driving. Yeah. These yeah. really high voltage, they don't put a insulation because it's impossible to put enough insulation on there that the electricity couldn't jump it anyway. Right. It's so powerful, the electricity cannot be contained. Well, and that's nothing compared to the power of God. And so we speak about this. Then the words that are used in Hebrew, the word dread here is that ima fear of God, that very strong fear of God that fell upon the people at uh, Jericho, and in particular Rahab, and that brought her to saving faith in God, but it produced in the other people in Jericho who saw the same thing. The Bible tells us their hearts became like wax, melted away, and there was nothing left. But even in a good sense, if, if God did not uh, in some way limit himself and how much of him we see at any moment, it could overcome us. And then the word here is terrify. It is a very specific word that's used to speak about the fear of God it is almost always used in, in the bad sense, in the, in the unholy fear sense, with a couple of exceptions. Jeremiah for one, Isaiah for two, but uh, what God was revealing to these prophets as what was gonna happen in the future was so powerful and so overwhelming that the prophets themselves, that it, it affected them very deeply. And these, these uh, three characteristics that we looked at last week enter into the, the, the the picture again. 
And so we're talking about the depths of despair. Uh, what the prophets witnessed, for example, imagine God revealing to you in, in great detail, you're living in their time, and God reveals to you in great detail these pagan armies coming in and not only attacking the armies of, of, of the people of Israel and, and Judah. Back in those days, the armies attacked civilians also. And the full force of that army being unleashed upon civilians who have no, no weapons to fight back with, the, the women and the children, the old, the old people. And, and these prophets seeing this, and what effect does that vision have upon them? Okay, that's what we're sort of thinking about it and moving towards. We don't have a lot of hymns that are written about the depths of despair. We do have some hymns that are written about the heights of joy. But, but we understand the heights of joy as they are compared with the, the depths of despair. Now in Russia, the man who started what they call the evangelical movement wrote a hymn, which I've never seen in English, but I think it would be a very good one. And in the, the, the name of the hymn in English would be, Heal My Doubting, in which the, the, this man, a very powerful preacher, started a movement that affected vast parts of, of Russia and helping them to come to Christ, confessed that from time to time he has doubts. And he's asking God to heal these doubts that torture him. It's a very good, good song. So, yeah. All right. So we have these three, three moments that we have to understand. We've talked about before the spirit of bondage. That's one. Number two, uh, I think last, last time we met, we talked about testing and trials and how one is working inwardly and one is working outwardly. Since then, I've done a lot more research into this and different people disagree as which one is testing and which one is trial. So I don't care which, which term you use to describe it. But what is most important is that we understand that this second moment is God working in us to, to remove the evil that's in us. And the third moment is God sending us out into the world to oppose or confront the evil that is in the world. Okay, we talked about that. We're gonna come back again and just touch on it a little bit more. Now, okay, yeah, I think you can see my picture here. This yeah. picture would be Job at the start of Job chapter three. He's standing on a peak and he has to move one way or the other. He either falls into the abyss or he returns to the holy fear of God. And while he's at this very peak moment, his wife comes and instead of showing kindness to him, 
she in effect kicks him and pushes him towards the abyss. Okay, remember we talked about that. Okay, this is a very real moment in our lives. Can I'm not telling you that it occurs every day, but it does happen. <clears throat> We have to be able to distinguish between these three moments so that we can help people who God puts under our care. So when we talk about the spirit of bondage or the spirit of slavery, of course, we're talking about Romans 8, 13, 8, 15. And we will, we, I have seen God work in many different ways to accomplish this task. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. Some call it bondage. <clears throat> but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, in this, one of the characteristics of this spirit of bondage or spirit of slavery is God is not convicting us about individual sins. He's convicting us that it's we ourselves who is a sinner. That we, that the, the sin that we commit comes out of what is in our heart. It's just a fruit of who we are. It's not talking about sinful deeds. It's talking about the sinfulness of us. This is a, and we've talked about this before also. During this time of spirit of bondage or slavery, it is the, our best and safest time to learn to hear and recognize God's voice because God's going to be speaking very clearly. In this spirit of bondage, there is a very strong desire to run away, just as Adam and Eve ran away. That's why some people think that this is an unholy fear, because this desire to run away from God is so strong. The second thing that we will notice is that there is a strong desire to cover ourselves. Just as Adam and Eve wanted to make fig leaves to cover themselves, people try to do things to cover themselves. So you will, begin, you will see people trying to find a covering of good deeds or some kind of outward righteousness getting real busy in churches sometimes. Uh, I mean, I've seen people try to, to say they're being called to preach, being called to music ministry, being called to missionary service. I've seen people want to adopt kids to, to prove how righteous they are. I mean, lots and lots of different ways where people try to try to do this to cover themselves, but it's, in essence, it's Adam and Eve making fig leaves for themselves. The whole point of this process is God is working in the person's heart and bringing them to the point, a moment in their life where they can no longer live without the Savior. Then they hear God's Spirit testify to their spirit that now we are God's child, okay? Now then, very often people will try to confuse this first moment with the second moment of, of God working on the evil that's inside us to purify and test us, to purify us, to refine us like that.
you know, I myself have never argued with a person who is in the spirit of bondage, but they call it something else. I don't see it as my, my job, my position uh, to try to convince them what's going on in their life spiritually. My life is, my, my job I see is to pray for them, to teach them the truth and help them rather than argue with them about these different points. But it is helpful for us if we can discern where the people are so that we can sort of know what to do to try to help them. Under spirit of bondage, I have seen men who could no longer work. Uh, they couldn't eat, couldn't sleep. Uh, I knew one man that he could no longer have relations with his wife because of this spirit of bondage. Uh, they, uh, they could only, he could, uh, these men that I'm talking about, uh, the common denominator was they couldn't do anything. Everything that they enjoyed, watching TV, sports, whatever, is taken away from them. And all they can do is just barely find enough strength to get out of bed to come to a Bible class or come to, to church on Sunday morning. I mean, it, it, I've seen it get very, very, the hand of God be very heavy on them. And so it might make someone think that something else is going on. But just, just to know that that possibility exists. Now then, the second moment we've talked about is God working on the evil in us. And we need, we as ministers or those who are going to be ministers, we need to be able to discern and distinguish the difference between God working to purify us, refine us, and transform us, and God sending us out to confront evil. And there's many scriptures of the New Testament that talk about this. Christ talks about the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. Okay. Now then, while we're under this second moment, I hope you can read this. Maybe not. Okay. And you see on one side we've got discipline and on the other side we've got punishment and the wrath of God. Okay. We have to be able to distinguish between discipline and punishment or wrath. Now, discipline has at, at its heart, the, 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 it, discipline is designed, created to improve, to make, to make things better, where punishment is satisfaction rendered for violating the law. Punishment has nothing to do with improving someone. It's the, res it's the punishment for violating the law. Discipline is to make us better, stronger, to part of the refining process. So our verse here is Proverbs 3.11. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord 
or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. <clears throat> you know, from time to time, I want to, I want to know that God disciplines me because the discipline is a sign of love. It's a sign that, that he is still working on me and that he, he hasn't given up. Hebrews chapter 12 takes this idea and develops it a little further Hebrews chapter 12 is such a wonderful. Chapter it builds on Hebrews 11 the, the Hall of Fame of Faith and it talks about all these people therefore since we have such a great cloud of witness surrounding us let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God, right hand of the throne of God. And then in verse 4. Speaking to, to he, he goes further, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, it seemed best to them. But he disciplined us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Okay. Now, again, this is where we need some discernment because the, the popular thing today, the tendency is when God sends discipline, they call this satanic attacks and they want to do uh, spiritual warfare against what is God what against what is what is God disciplining them well then you're working against yourself and you're working against God so having the ability to recognize discipline and to point it out to, to people is very helpful and it can protect them. Now, we've never talked about this before. First John chapter four. Starting in verse 17. Now this is a, a verse of scripture that is used 
very often to try to prove that there is no such thing as the, the holy fear of God. Right. But when we understand the context of this verse, then it immediately jumps out at us what God is trying to say. Now, remember, we're thinking about the difference between God disciplining us and God punishing us. Okay? So, chapter 4, verse 17. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Now, we remember, of course, that in the fear of the Lord, there is a strong confidence. But let's think about the day of judgment for those who have rejected God. Will that be discipline or will that be punishment? Punishment. Punishment. Okay. Why can we have confidence in the day of judgment? Because our punishment was put on Christ. And there is no more punishment for us. There is discipline, but discipline is very different than punishment. Okay? Perfect love casts out fear because fear, this unholy fear, involves punishment. And the one who has this unholy fear is not perfected in love. Now, there are some kinds of the fear of God that people want to say is a baby kind of the holy fear of God. For example, fear to do wrong or fear of punishment. This unholy fear involves punishment. So if there's pun if there is a fear of punishment or a thought of punishment in this whatever kind of fear they're describing, it's unholy. Unholy fear has to do with punishment. Holy fear of God, remember, is a fountain of life. Salvation is near to them. It's the, the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. All of these things that we have looked at, looked at in the past. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but per perfect fear casts out this unholy fear because unholy fear involves punishment, and the one who has this unholy fear is not perfected in love. Okay. So if we remember, what do people do under the spirit of bondage when, there begins, when God begins to convict them that they themselves are are sinful, they run away from God, and they try to hide. They have no confidence before God. The confidence comes when they hear God's spirit say to their spirit, now you are a child of God. That's a very big distinction, very big important moment in, in any person's life. Okay. Any questions on that so far? So holy fear never has to do with punishment. Holy fear and punishment never go together. Holy fear and discipline always go together. And it's pretty important that we understand 
the difference between punishment and discipline. Okay. I, I pray and trust that, that you guys will always discipline your children. I hope you will never punish them. In my, in, in my life, I've had both, but uh, we should never punish our children, always discipline. Going back to like 1985, 86, 87, right along in there, uh, Elise had to go and, and learn how to be a principal of a Christian school. And one of the, one of the rules that they taught principals, because these Christian schools believed in corporal punishment, is you never use corporal punishment when you're mad. Number two, you always get a neutral person to do the corporal punishment. Number three, you always explain to the child why you are doing this. And the child has to confess, yes, I did it. And then after you, you swat the child a couple of times, you hug them and comfort them and say, I love you. I'm not mad at you. We want you to do good. They had a very high standard that had to be met before you could could even think about or attempt any kind of corporal punishment. And if the child didn't confess, then you never did it. Because they wanted, they were trying to make a very hard and fast distinction between punishing a child and disciplining the child. Okay. And I'm sure you could say this about in horse training also. There are people who beat horses because they get angry with them. Right. But the horse doesn't learn anything from a, that kind of a beating. Or with a dog or with any, any other kind of animal that we're trying to train. Okay, so the difference between punishment and discipline. Okay. So then let's look at a couple of verses to make sure that we understand what is the wrath of God. Uh, the Gospel of John chapter 3. You know, most people in America know John 3.16, but there's so much more to the Gospel of John chapter 3 than verse 13. Uh, verse 16, verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Okay, now, if we were reading this in Russian, we would see that the verb that's translated of abide here is the exact same verb that speaks about Christ abiding in his Father. And, and it's the exact same word that speaks about us abiding in Christ. Now in English, the English versions very often they use different words to describe these different relationships. But in Greek and in Russian, it's the exact same word. So let's think about what does it mean to abide in Christ versus abiding in the wrath of God. One is life, one is death. That's a very hard, fast, clear distinction. It should become easy for us to discern the difference 
between abiding in Christ and abiding in God's wrath. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. You can probably say this one by memory. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness. Okay. Romans chapter five, Verses 9 and 10. We're going to start with verse 8. But God demonstrates his old love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were abiding in the wrath of God, God demonstrated his love towards us in that Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Okay? That the work that on the cross, the wrath of God was satisfied because Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. So there is no more penalty for us to pay. Jesus did that for us. First Peter 2.24 This is talking about Christ. We're going to back up to verse 21 because it's, it's helping us to have some context to this third moment when God sends us out into the world to confront evil. Okay, let's even back up to verse 20. For what credit is there if, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if, when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it. This finds favor with God. Now, I'm going to tell you from painful experience, it is neither fun or pleasant to have to patiently endure when people punish you or are angry with you because you are doing right. But that is part of what is included when God sends us out into the world to confront evil. If you go into a backslidden church and you begin to preach the truth to them, they are not going to love you. They're not going to receive you kindly. You're going to get some of the worst most unfair, most underhanded, most stab you in the back attacks that you've ever experienced in your life. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure, 
this finds favor with God, for you have been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return while suffering. He uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. Okay. The, the wrath of God was poured out upon Christ on the cross. The penalty for our sins, Jesus Christ paid with his body. In 1 John 2.2, 2, there is this word that nobody really knows how best to interpret. Some people call it propitiation. Some people call it, uh, what's the other one, propitiation? I think it's expiation. What was the reference you gave us again? First John 2.2. Two. Okay. So what does King James say here? Uh, propitiation. That's what in New American Standard. Some other verses use a different word. I mean, you can study it out, and basically they mean the same thing. Uh, the idea is that he is our satisfaction. Remember, punishment has to do with satisfying satisfaction or satisfying the law because the law was broken. It's the penalty of the law. So, and he himself, Christ, is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours also, but for those of the whole world. By this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Okay. Now, in just a second, we're going to see exactly how that fits in, this keeping his commandments. And 1 John 4.10 In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Okay. Now then, Proverbs 3.11. This is when we begin to see how obeying the commandments fits in here. And Proverbs 3, starting in verse 11. We looked at it earlier this evening, and we've looked at it some weeks ago, too, where he says, My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord. Okay. And I think you'll remember, it's been a while now, but when we first looked at this, I shared with you that Kyle and, and Delish translate this, the school of Yahweh, my son, despise thou not. You remember that? I don't recall that. Okay, That's we it. did look at it, but it's been a while. Yeah. So here he says, the discipline of the Lord in modern translations, but Kyle and Delish translated the school of Yahweh, my son despise not. Now, they do that because the word that's translated uh, do not despise the discipline, it appears 51 times in the Hebrew Bible, 38 of those times in King James, it's translated as instruction or correction. So the instruction 
of God, my son, do not despise. The correction of God, my son, do not despise. That is God's school. And it has to do with, it's a direct reference to the law of God. Now, I know we haven't talked about this in any, any detail yet, but I think I've hinted at it a couple of times. Psalms 19.7 through uh, 10, we have these, these series of statements about the law of God, yeah. and they're all uh, they're synonyms. And so yeah. the law of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, etc. And it is it is not the way that we normally think of the law, but it is a biblical way of thinking of the law. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring or converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord. And the word their testimony is referring to the actual two tablets that God made and gave to Moses. The testimony of the Lord is sure. This is the same word that's translated Abraham believed God, making wise the simple or making the silly or seducible wise. It's talking about the, the law as, as a school. The way of the law is a school where God teaches us and disciplines us, shows us the right way to go and the, the right way to live. Uh, Galatians 3.24 is, uh, is our place in the New Testament. And for some people, particularly today, it is very hard for them to think of the law of God in a positive sense. Because the law has been misused and mistaught for so long. But the Bible, biblically speaking, the law is very different than the common, the common understanding. Galatians 3.24, therefore, what is the law? The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. Okay, what does it say in King James? Schoolmaster. Schoolmaster. In Russian, it says the word children's driver. Huh. That it's the, it, it refers to back in those days, they had a slave whose job it was, because you know, you had to pay for your school and it cost a lot. So you, you bought a slave and it was the slave's job to make sure the kids got up, got dressed, got to school on time, that the kids had their homework done, that the kids behaved in class, and then the tutor, the, the slave would also learn the lessons, come home and help them to do their homework and make sure the kids learn. So he was a children's driver. It was his job. The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, our children's driver, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So this, the law in that sense is God's school. God's school of correction, of discipline, and it points us to Christ and shows us how to live. Okay, some concrete things that we need to be working on to become the, the men of God that God wants us to be. Number one, we do not pray for God to take away discipline. You know, much of, of modern day prayer meetings 
is praying for God to take away discipline. Instead, we pray that the person will quickly learn what God is trying to teach them. So in this area, it's very important that we can discern the difference between discipline and punishment. Okay? Is that sort of starting to make a little sense? Yeah. Okay, good. Now then, <clears throat> when God sends us out to confront evil, and it's very, very important that we understand this. Next part. When God sends us out to confront evil, we do not have to be 100% perfect to pass the test. Some people get really discouraged because under as they're confronting evil, they find themselves not able to 100% function correctly. Okay, we just read about just a minute ago, to endure patiently. When you're trying to do good and people are yelling and screaming at you, we try to endure patiently, but sometimes we may become impatient. Sometimes we may feel ourselves unjustly put upon. Those are normal human reactions in, in this sense. We, we always try to do the best that we can. Job was not 100% perfect, and he passed the test. And we can pass the test also, even if we're 100%. Next, when God sends us out to confront evil, the power that overcomes evil is not from us. It is not in our own strength or in our own power. The power comes from God. We are merely the vessel that stands there and then God uses that vessel to overcome the evil. In, in this sense of the word, God sending us out to overcome evil is very similar to prayer. I'll, I'll draw it for you. We don't know exactly how prayer works. Okay. Whoa. Can you see my picture? Yeah. But something happens when we pray and then God moves and answers over here. In, in Russian, we would call it a mystery. It means yeah. we know it happens, but we can't explain it. Right. Something happens here between us and God. And as a result, God does this over here. Right. We do not manipulate God. We do not control God. But something happens that, that is real. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We can't explain it, but it happens. Okay, now the same picture, except this person is where they're praying. Imagine someone standing up to or confronting evil. Mm -hmm. 
and something happens in that moment. And as a result, God over here does something powerful. Okay, think about Deacon Stephen as he's being stoned to death. And Saul is consenting to his death. We don't right. know if that means he threw a stone or not, but he was consenting. And in that moment, God does something very powerful, and it, it is a very powerful conviction to Saul. And he's instrumental in Saul becoming the Apostle Paul. Stephen did not have the power to make that transformation. We don't have the power. But somehow in, in God's, God's design, something happens when we stand up. Just as <clears throat> do our prayers have to be perfect for God to answer them? Thankfully not. No. In fact, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. We don't know what to pray a lot of times or even how, but the Holy Spirit somehow is an interpreter of what's in our heart, and he puts it in the right form, in the right way to God. And so... When we're thinking about confronting evil, we remember the power does not come from us. Okay, this there is a willingness to suffer and a willingness to suffer unjustly that must be on our part. Is this a number four? This is still in God sending us out to, against evil. Okay. So we got... Number th the first three points are we don't have to be perfect. The power comes from God. There has to be a willingness to be used of God. That's number three. This willingness uh, includes a willingness to suffer because very often uh, there will be deep wounds, and as we saw in the, in the instance of uh, Deacon Stephen, even death. Now, have y'all ever heard any of the songs written by Ron Owens? I think so. Okay. Well, your homework, as soon as we finish here tonight, if you will go to YouTube and type in Ron Owens, have you no scar? Ron Owens used to work with Henry Blackaby. I don't know if you ever heard Henry Blackaby speak. I've heard of him. I don't know if I've heard him speak. Ron Owens used to do the music for Tozier. You ever heard of Tozier? Yeah. Um, he's worked with some very, very godly preachers. And he, he has written some songs that express some of the deeper truths of the Bible that you don't I'm sorry. Oh, no, sorry. I pulled up the video, so I have it ready afterward, and the commercial went off. I paused it. Okay. Have you no scar? But he talks about this in the song. Uh, uh, the, this willingness to suffer when God sends us out. And we talked about this last week, but I'm going to touch on it again. There is a vast difference between a person who has, in, who has, as a theme of his life, generally has had no trust in God and who does despair and suffer. And it's revealed in a most terrible manner. Okay, I've told you before about hidden reefs. I've seen people's lives who have been destroyed. The whole bottom of their ship of their life destroyed and their boat, their ship sinks because they have come in contact with these hidden reefs. And number two, a man who has a lifelong habit of his soul that he trusts in God and because of intense suffering, 
he gets kicked into the abyss. Okay. Remember, this is Job. At that moment, he needed kindness from his friends, and his wife comes and just kicks him right off into the abyss at that moment of extreme weakness. So his trust was momentarily repressed, seemingly paralyzed. It may seem as if his trust in God is overwhelmed. But then we remember in Job those very strong words, but I know that my Redeemer lives. And in the end, he will stand on the earth. Okay. Okay. Now then. Okay, any questions about this part so far? Oh, I just wanted to verify. So any kind of trial that a believer goes through or any kind of negative, we'll call negative thing, maybe some, is either the result of God disciplining them or punishment no. or sin? Nothing to do with punishment. If it's a believer, there's no more punishment. Well, because... no more, um, so then... The two she's thinking of is uh, a trial, which is confronting and, evil acting right. outside of the person, and a chastening, which would be to get rid of some remaining evil within the person. Right. So we have that's the two main things we have to distinguish. Which words, which terms do you use for each? Testing and trials are kind of synonymous, but I know how, they are. How do you distinguish um, between the two? Times? I personally think of trials as when we're being sent out. Okay. I think about the fiery darts of Satan. I think about the putting on the whole armor of God and having put on the armor to stand to resist the, 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 the devil. Uh, As opposed to a chastening, which is to correct us or discipline us for something that's wrong in us. Right. Okay, so if you think about the armor of God is necessary to confront evil, well, why would we need the armor of God to protect us from God's discipline? You're right, right. Okay, to me, that's how I keep it straight. We've got the world, the flesh, and the devil. And if we're fighting the flesh, then that would be a chastening. And if it's the world or the devil, then it's a, a trial. And we need the it. armor of God. Right. And it's the power comes from God. Right. We're just the, we're like the little boy, David, standing up against the giant. There's no way the little boy can win. Right. But we stand and we testify to the power of God, and then we let God do what only God can do. So then either, either a, okay, so chastening has to do with you've sinned and it's, it's the, the Lord chastening you for yeah. that. Yeah, it's right. The, it's God developing us and making us more useful for his kingdom's sake. Okay. So then um, consequence for sin is something in totally different. From that's me. totally something different. We're not okay, talking there, about that yeah. at all. Okay. That's where I was confusing them. Right. Because even the believer can have consequences for sin. Right. But that, that, that's not necessarily chastening. Right. So let's think about step two in a personal way. As, oh, I hate to think about it, but step two would be in late 1971, I, I was called to preach. 
And so my pastor practiced, if you're called to preach, you need to be preaching. And his idea was, if you're called to preach, you always need to be ready to preach. So about 1.30, 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, I would get a phone call, you're preaching tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so my first sermon, I wrote it all out. I mean, word for word. I figured it'd take 30 minutes. I read it all in about 40 seconds. Oh, no. Yeah. 40 seconds. And so I had nothing else to say. And so I said, in review, and I read it again. And then the pastor stood up. He didn't say a word of rebuke or anything. He gave the invitation. We were home by 6.30. Church <laughs> started people, at 6. Some people were like, some, have him preach more often. Some people really liked you that night. Yes. Okay. Oh, man. But now let's think about this God working in this step number two to refine, correct, discipline, teach, and step by step, I became a more effective preacher. Say that again. Step by step, I became a more effective preacher. Yeah. You know, I was willing to give it my best shot. I had no clue what I was doing. Sure. But step by step, God disciplined me, he corrected me, he helped me, he grew me to make me a, a more effective preacher. Okay, so think about this step two is God developing each individual to be the very best vessel that he designed them to be so that they can accomplish what he wants accomplished in his kingdom. Okay, and step number three is when we actually go out there and do it. What was step number one again? Step number one is God bringing us to that place where we can no longer live without the Savior. Say again, sorry, you're God, cut out. Okay, God bringing us to the place that we can no longer live without the Savior. Okay. Because until we are God's adopted child, there's very little that we can do for God's kingdom. And so God brings us to that saving knowledge of himself and his spirit says to our spirit, now you are my child. That's a one-time thing. That, that process is one time. Now, as a born a, 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 an adopted child of God, God begins the process of, we've talked about it using many different words, transforming our mind, renewing our mind, uh, the school of discipline. And step by step, God makes us better and more useful tools are better and more useful vessels, if you like that word better, in his kingdom. And then step number three is God sending us out to confront the evil. Now, I cannot tell you with 100% accuracy that every Christian will have these huge battles in confronting evil. Like Deacon Stephen. You know, how many men has God asked to do what Deacon Stephen, what he asked Deacon Stephen to do? More than one but it's, it's more rare. Or to do like what Paul did. But in other ways, to stand up and fight against evil, yes. And 
some of the battles are small and we, we, we don't recognize them at first. But the more we grow in the fear of the Lord, the more we see what's really happening spiritually. The more we see that, that God does put us in these situations to confront evil, it happens more than we realize. And some are going to be small, some are going to be big. <clears throat> Not everybody's going to stand here like Job did. Okay, you, you, and there is a part of me that hopes that you and your wife never have to stand where Job did. Okay? But there's another part of me that hopes that you will. Yeah. Because that will mean then that God has changed your character and, and prepared you for something monumental like with Job. Okay, you understand? I think so. Okay, good. All right. So I got just a little bit more to go, but I don't want to. It's sort of a transition kind of a thing. And I don't want to start it till we make sure that we know we have these three moments down. And you probably haven't heard of these before, so this is probably something new. No, I, I think um, just kind of the general ideas, but not specifically these these three moments. Okay. Right? Um, the way you talked about the spirit of bondage again to fear, uh, that that explained for me uh, kind of like that transition where God lays hold on us and we transition from unholy fear to the holy fear because he because he binds us um, or we're in that bondage where we can't run even if we if we wanted to. to yeah right um and these the the second and the third they won't necessarily just be singular moments um or should we think of them more as that? Because it's like there's there's different there's a process of him chasing and just disciplining us to prepare us for use, right? Yes, there is a process, but in my experience, the process has been discrete individual lessons. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the lessons build one on another. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so after we learn one, I mean, uh, in, in St. Kitts, this really became very, very clear to me mm -hmm. for the very first time in my life. And, and I, th I know for sh I'm pretty sure I've shared this with you, the progression in Romans 5, where he says, we exalt in tribulation. Yeah. Tribulation brings perseverance or patience. Patience, proven character, and proven character, hope. Yeah. So we go through those four steps, and then we start over again, but in a different area of our life, and then do the four steps. And then when we learn that, we start over again, but in, the, in a different area. So we follow the same progression, the same pattern, but it's just God working on different areas of our lives. Right. Prepare us. Okay, and and as we're going through that process in Romans five, he's uh, he's chastening us to to prepare us more for use. Right. Okay. Now let's think about the second one: patience. We don't get the patience till we learn the lesson of that tribulation. So if we don't pass that test, because this is moment number two, this working on the evil within us, then God just repeats the lesson. 
Now right. the circumstances of the lesson may change, but the, the, the concept that's being taught, the idea that's being taught doesn't change. And you just go over and over and over and over the same lesson. And I was doing that in St. Kitts every day. And in my praying that one particular day, God said, Kenny, why are you so stubborn? Learn the lesson and let's go on. And it was like a light bulb goes off in my head. Like, wow. You're killing me, man. Why was I so stupid? Yeah. And I learned the lesson and God gave me patience. And then he changed my character. And then once he changed my character, he gave me great hope. So I went home that day and I said to Elise, Elise, we've been doing this wrong. We've got to learn the lesson. And then within two days, this thing that I've been butting my head against the wall for for like 10 weeks was accomplished. And I did nothing. God did it all. Okay. Righty. That's uh, that's lots to chew on for me right there. Okay, we're just going to touch on this next part. Yeah. Because it ties the beauty of all of this together. Okay. Remember that for the despairing man, there should be kindness from his friends. Okay. So we're going to take that word that's translated kindness. And we're going to see other places in the Bible where God speaks about that particular kind of kindness. Psalm give me that, eight, you give me that Job reference again? 614. Okay, there it is. Okay. Yeah. The despairing man, that's the one whose heart's poured out like wax. It's empty. Yeah. Okay. Next week, when we get into the prophets, we're going to see this really, really hard and heavy and deep. There should be kindness for, from his friends. Okay. Psalm 86, 11, 12, and 13. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will give thank, thanks to you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and will glorify your name forever. For your loving kindness towards me is great, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Okay, if we think of Sheol like the abyss, is loving kindness, it's the same word for the despairing man, there should be kindness. Your loving kindness towards me is great, great and you have delivered my soul from these depths of Sheol, from despair. Okay? You, you see how, it's, how they sort of tie together. He unites our hearts so that we always fear his name. Then he reveals to us his loving kindness his loving kindness delivers us from despair. Okay, same idea, but in Jeremiah 31. This is sometime when you have a chance. Brother Roberts preaches about eight or ten hours from Jeremiah 31 at verse 3. Okay. The, this chapter is introduced, Israel's mourning turned to joy. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when it went to find its rest, the Lord appeared to him from afar, saying, this verse number three, 
I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. That's that same kindness from, for the despairing man. Now, think about the confidence you have when you have heard God's Holy Spirit say to your spirit, now you are my child. And then he says, I have loved you with an everlasting, unchanging love. And because of that, I have drawn you to myself with loving kindness. Okay. And verse 25, that same chapter. So he has loved you with an everlasting love. Verse 25, for I satisfy the weary ones and refresh everyone who languishes. Job went into, was kicked into the abyss by his wife and friends. God rescued him. He drew him back with loving kindness. And then he satisfied the weary one and refreshed everyone who languishes. And I, in next week, we're, God willing, Lord willing, we're going to see how, what happened to Jeremiah when he was in the abyss. And, and this is God's answer to Jeremiah, personally, but to, to us also, okay? And this satisfy, where he says he satisfies the weary ones, that's the verse that is used at least four times in the Old Testament, talking about God filling his vessels with the Holy Spirit. Just like Isaiah 11, one through three. Yeah. It's sort of cool how it works together. That God unites our hearts so that he, we always fear him. Yeah. Then he, with loving kindness, is towards us is very great. He loves us with an unchanging love. With loving kindness, he draws us. Yeah. And when he draws us, he fills us. To me, that's really, really beautiful and cool how it all works together. Okay? So there's a lot to chew on tonight. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, just learning, learning to discern what lessons he's trying to teach. Uh, I've, makes me wonder if I've been stuck on the same lesson for a really long time uh, or the same lessons, but uh, maybe that's an area of discernment that I've really not, not been able to discern what the lesson is. Right. And if we ask, God will tell us, at least in my experience. Yeah. Lord, what are you trying to teach me? Help me not to be so stupid. Pretty much. Yeah, that's a good prayer. <laughs> All right, so there was a lot here tonight. All right. But, but on what? But uh, hopefully next week we're going to go even further. This is sort of like step one, and there's a big jump between step one and step two. Okay. All righty.